Good afternoon, everybody. Sorry, we're running just a smidge over this afternoon. And we had some few little technical issues that we we're working. So we're glad you are here for the third webinar series on turnover. And we're just really glad you're with us today. There is so much going on in our world. And we just want to take a minute and just sort of Breathe and exhale so we can just sort of clear our minds and get ready for the content that is to come. Okay. Well, I'm Suzanne Spear. I'm the Director of Workforce here at ACU. And I know we've gone over this before, but it, just in case you are just joining us for the third of the three-part series. So ACU stands for the Association of Clinicians for the Underserved. And we are a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to two issues, um, both access to care and clinician support. And we were founded over 20 years ago as a National Health Service Corps alumni organization. And we've evolved a lot since then, but we really are continuing to be focused on the care and the, um, the care of underserved populations as well as the, that clinician support. And again, I am here with the STAR Center, which is the Solutions, Training, and Resources for Recruitment and Retention Center. And it is our national cooperative agreement through HRSA's Bureau of Primary Healthcare. And so if you haven't been to our website, if this is the first time you're joining us in the series, please go check it out, chcworkforce.org, for all sorts of free, yes, free tools and resources there. Just a few webinar housekeeping items. So first of all, we are recording and we will send this recording out to you after today's session along with the slide. So if you're thinking to yourself, gosh, I really wish I had a copy of this or I wish I could just rewind that, um, you can do that um, through that recording that we will also be posted on our website. Um, secondly, we want you to ask questions. So this is an opportunity for you to get your questions answered. And as things come up, if you want, you know, clarified on anything, please go ahead and do that through either the questions or the chat box. And um, we'll also have some time probably for Q&A at the end. So um, anyway, so you can ask during the webinar or you can wait till the end, totally up to you, but we encourage questions as we go along. Third, please complete the evaluation at the end. Super important to us as we seek to improve what we're doing here at the STAR Center as well as for our reporting purposes to HRSA. Again, questions, please put them in the questions or the chat box. You can also email Mariah Blake, who is our program manager, and she would be happy to get you going in the right direction. Just as a review, some of the goals of our series. So we could sort of have three, three goals. Sorry, I'm, I'm um, off today. Um, so we have three goals of our series. One is to understand the impact of turnover on an organization. And we covered that during our first session. So you can go back and listen to that if you haven't had the opportunity to do so. Secondly, we wanted to identify organizational risks factors contributing to turnover, which was covered um, last week. And then third, and what we're mainly going to cover today, are identifying steps to reduce that turnover. So again, last time, um, we went over the reasons for turnover, and we also debuted our turnover tool. You should have received the link to the turnover tool that was totally hot, hot off the presses. We had a few last minute things that we were working on, um, but it is live and it's active now. Um, so we hope that if you haven't had a chance to even just click on that link, that you'll do that and that you will take that turnover tool, that you will get those, um, that you will get those recommendations and that you will be able to take some of the action items that we are gonna cover today. And if you haven't had a chance to take a look at the turnover tool, here's what it looks like, the first page. Um, and there is gonna be a link in your chat. Mariah is gonna um, chat it in there. So you can have it at the top of your inbox, so to speak. And so you can go ahead and check that out after the session. And um, we're really excited about it um, and hope you guys will um, be able to use it as you're taking a look at the turnover at your organization.
sorry, to get my screen to go. And again, um, we are thrilled to have Alexia Eslan from John Snow Incorporated with us again today. And um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Alexia. Thanks so much, Alexia. Great, thank you so much, Suzanne. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you again. <laughs> um, excited for the last webinar in this series. Today, we are going to be focusing on providing some action steps and examples on supporting provider retention. At our last webinar, we covered the seven factors that impact voluntary turnover. Um, and uh, today, what I will be doing is actually providing examples of things that you can do to um, enhance provider retention for each of these uh, different factors. You are also experts in many of these areas, and I would love for you to share as I'm going through um, the examples, other examples that you are implementing at your practice. So please uh, feel free to chat as we go through. And um, also, if you have any questions, please go ahead and chat those. And as Suzanne said, we'll have some time at the end to do some uh, Q&A. So let's start off with a general approach that I'd like to take uh, for all these seven factors. Um, whichever factor you're looking at, um, it's always good to start off by surveying and assessing what are your providers, um, you know, what brings satisfaction to your providers in their work, what they feel is adequate compensation, what they need in order to have a work-life balance, um, and so forth. Then also identifying what are the current resources and barriers to supporting provider needs and wants. Commit to a systems approach to making provider retention a shared responsibility at all levels of the organization, including executive leadership, managers and other core leaders, as well as the individuals themselves. And use improvement science to test approaches to improving joint work in the organization and implement successful changes. Um, so this, again, this approach can be used for any of those factors and is truly hearing from others, uh, hearing from the providers, identifying what you can do, committing to it, and then testing and implementing. And today we are focusing on provider retention, but this is an approach that can definitely be applicable um, to all staff. So let's start off with uh, first compensation. So a few things that can be done using that model is first identifying what are the opportunities for improvement within your um, resource constraints. So first looking at pay equity, look at how providers compare to each other within your organization as well as how they stack up to local and regional benchmarks. We talked about that in the last webinar. Identify also other areas for improvement that support pay. For example, such as the number of hours worked, I know many practices encourage providers to work part-time, 80% or sometimes less, um, and that helps to keep a better work-life balance. Look at the number of appointments seen within a day. Track quality indicators that could be linked to pay or simply work satisfaction. Look at team participation and administrative roles and other ways that you could um, enhance um, those uh, compensation. Then once you look at these different components, then conduct individual provider meetings to document any concerns or individual provider goals that may impact planning. And then use the data collected in assessments to begin compensation planning. One model to look at um, for compensation is um, a pay for performance model. So looking at alter alternative payment models is a good way to potentially um, enhance provider retention. Focusing more on quality versus quantity actually is proven to uh, improve uh, provider satisfaction. And so a uh, pay for performance model uh, provides a bonus on top of the salary to providers to achieve certain set indicators. These indicators or incentives can be linked to quality indicators as well as others, including patient satisfaction and even citizenship, which supports engagement of providers in leadership and other aspects that are important to them. 
So if you're utilizing this approach, a pay for performance approach, it's important to be careful that measures are uh, really reflect the goals and are in the physicians or the provider's control. And design and implementation are both important in promoting faculty satisfaction with incentive program. On the right hand side of my screen, you can see listed some possible design features that then can help enhance your pay for performance program. So frequent small payments may be more psychologically motivating than one large sum payment. Paying more frequently allows the reward time to more closely match the work done to earn it and have a greater influence on behavior, even if the payments are smaller. Research has also shown that using graduated uh, target thresholds is more effective than an absolute threshold. For example, a bonus given when 75% of targeted women receive mammograms may seem unattainable compared to a smaller bonus received at 25% with increasingly higher bonuses at higher threshold levels. Incentive payments seem more meaningful when not lumped in with salary. And often in-kind incentives such as trips, dinners can feel more valuable than cash incentives. So looking at other ways other than monetary incentives to motivate um, and incentivize your, your providers. Annual performance reviews can also be used as uh, potentially non-monetary incentives. Okay, so let's now uh, move to professional development. At our last uh, webinar, I actually asked um, all of you to provide some examples of what you were doing around professional development. And some of the things that were shared were providing up to 40 hours of CME and covering costs to up to a certain amount each year, providing in-house trainings that are required for all, as well as supporting regional or state level training opportunities, having sessions on burnout prevention, offering 3,000 per year for each provider and between 40 to 80 hours per year of additional time off for providers, and building education affiliations. These are all great examples of things that, that you could do um, around professional development. I've also listed some additional ones here on the screen. Uh, for example, co-designing a professional development program together with providers for your organization or together with, for example, your primary care association to support all providers in the network. Um, and having that professional development program focus on areas of highest interest and need for that cohort of providers. Uh, assessing what these areas are is a critical piece of co-designing the process. In addition, another example is providing or participating of case conferencing opportunities to learn from peers. For example, utilizing the ECHO model. I know there's a, a lot of um, ECHO opportunities um, right now for uh, provider, for, for learning. Um, and so taking advantage of those opportunities or creating your own. Designing cross-team learning opportunities. Um, this is another important aspect, looking at everyone within the team and designing opportunities for them to learn from each other. I actually, a couple of years ago, I was uh, co-presenting at a leadership workshop with second and third year residents. And I asked them um, what their team members, especially their medical assistants, they worked with needed from them to succeed in their work. And it was very interesting because I got mostly blank stares. Uh, most of them had not had a meaningful conversation with their medical assistants about what they needed from them and vice versa. Um, so creating these opportunities that uh, for teams to grow stronger together and get to work together through professional development is um, a, a potential. Also participating of state uh, level quality improvement initiatives, which I know many of you are, for example, like uh, state innovation models, MAT training, uh, the comprehensive primary care plus or primary care first uh, initiatives and so forth. And trying to provide these opportunities during working hours to support the work-life balance is also a good thing to be looking at. Okay, moving along to the healthcare community. So here I'm providing a, as well a few um, different examples of this. Exta establishing strong partnerships with specialty and hospital services is critical to having a strong and efficient referral network that is patient-centric and supports provider job satisfaction. 
So creating a memorandum of agreement, care compacts, and other documentation that clearly states each organization's role in patient care, documentation, communication with each other, and costs are critical. If your practice is small, looking at creating alliances with other practices or organizations close to you to have stronger negotiation power with hospitals, uh, for example, could be very valuable. And working with your primary care association to create group agreements could be helpful as well. So really looking at how you can strengthen that network that your patients and your providers have access to. Another um, example is assessing patient social needs and establishing a comprehensive system to, to support them. For example, co-location with social services. I'm, I'm seeing more and more um, of new buildings being created where social services is co-located with um, primary care. Um, good referral network, making sure that you have a good referral network, um, having patient navigators to connect patients to services, and other examples like that really help to address um, the patient's social needs. Um, another example is the practice um, offering multiple modalities for patient visits. So these could include in-person uh, telehealth visits, e-visits, uh, now telephone visits, um, and having all team members involved in supporting the multiple visit modality is a key piece. And please, uh, just a note to chat any questions you might have um, as I'm going through this. So moving along uh, to practice environment. In 2013, the RAN Health was hired by the American Medical Association to determine high priority determinants of professional satisfaction. Uh, researchers gathered data from 30 physician practices in six states using a combination of surveys and semi-structured interviews. And these are the, the findings. Um, physicians, especially those in primary care, were frustrated when demand for greater quantity of care limited the time they could spend with each patient, detracting from the quality of care in some cases. Electronic health records, as we all know, were a source of both problems and frustration with major concerns about interoperability between systems and with the amount of physician time involved in data entry. Um, so finding ways to increase joy in practice is key to provider retention. And looking at the 10 building blocks of high-performing primary care that are listed here, and I'm sure most of you are very familiar with, um, it's important looking at each of these components and seeing how they can be improved or enhanced with sufficient technology is an important step in improving the practice environment. I want to share a video with you about the team-based care model. So the team-based care model has a lot of um, evidence behind it that it does um, support and increase provider and staff satisfaction, and it contributes to higher quality of care and happier patients. Um, so I'm going to give this a try, and we'll see if it works. So I'll just show an excerpt of Even though I work with great people and had great staff in positions all around me, uh, the job was too hard for me before and I could not get it done. Uh, and it was uh, frustrating and I was feeling like I could not be a good physician. It made the job undoable. The uh, amount of money we lost in turnover uh, was significant. People were feeling incredibly burned out in doing the work that they do. Um, we're looking at the potential in the next 10 years for primary care providers to have massive panels uh, of patients if we were to continue doing things the same way. Five, 6,000 patients for a provider. And there's all kinds of strategies about how that could be parsed out. If the culture doesn't change, it won't matter how many people I have working with me or for me or I'm supervising, I'm still not going to be able to let go of that and let somebody else be sharing in that with me. And I think that's critical. And so patients were telling us that growing big was a problem and we had to reframe uh, how we were going to grow by being in uh, teams.
our common goal is that everybody comes to work every day to do the best job that they can and deliver the best care they can. And in order for that to happen, it can't be up to one person. We have to share that responsibility. But it is a learning curve because it is definitely not the way that I was trained as a provider and I would say the vast majority of providers were trained. A lot of practices that are intern uh, and residency uh, programs talk about team-based care, but what I am finding is that when they come to practice, they're not very well versed in it. So it is difficult, I think, when people show up, if they haven't been trained in that way and truly understand the concepts, to then educate them and sort of bring them into the fold, um, just like a sports team. It doesn't happen and click overnight. It takes a while. It was a completely different model for uh, clinicians, uh, that we were going to move them out of the provider offices and into a, a space that was shared, a bullpen space. Um, it is hard uh, as a provider, whether it's a nurse practitioner or a PA, to give up some control and share that responsibility. It requires a lot of trust. It requires a tremendous amount of communication. The uh, strategies that we had at Clinica to build trust for these teams or to provide time for people to actually meet together and talk together. Having opportunities to bond a little bit more outside of caring for patients. We also um, had uh, supervisory level people and leadership level people join care teams that were having particularly difficult times and they would actually be in the meeting uh, and um, be problem solving with the team to try and get over barriers. There was a camaraderie uh, that did not exist in our clinic uh, prior to that. I think it took us 10 years to get to that point that we tested all the changes and then were assured that the culture was going to support maintaining those changes going forward and was ready to take on other changes. Great. Well, hopefully everyone was able to hear that okay. I, I just wanted to show you an excerpt just so you got an idea about um, the physician's perspective on team-based care. Um, in this video, Carolyn Shepard was one of the providers who used to be the Chief Medical Officer of Clinica Family Health in Colorado, uh, was featured as well as Andy Tremblay, who is a family practice provider at uh, Dartmouth Hedgehog in New Hampshire. And both of those organizations have implemented the team-based care model and it has been really successful. You heard right there at the end, Carolyn Shepard was mentioning how um, how it really took a long time. It took about 10 years for them to truly implement the model and make it sustainable and, um, and make it trickle through the whole organization. They, they're a large uh, federally qualified health center and have, I think, about 13, 14 sites, and so making sure that it was spread throughout all the sites. Um, so this is one model of care that, that could be considered that really does have evidence behind it um, to improve uh, provider retention and uh, provider satisfaction. Um, here I wanted to share some more examples of things to consider around the practice environment. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I wanted to highlight uh, a couple. Um, so in-visit scribing by nurses or a maze. Um, is starting to become more popular. Uh, Family Care Network is a 13-site physician-owned network in North Washington State, and they implemented a care model that includes two nurses, uh, what they call flow staff per provider, so a two-to-one ratio. And they have one nurse that scribes while the other rooms the next patient. And this model has allowed the providers to focus on the patients, see more patients during the day, and avoid having to stay late to finish up notes. Um, it also highlights these components and benefits of uh, working as a team. So this one uh, model also to consider, um, increasing correspondence with your EHR vendor and asking what you need um, is also another uh, possibility. I'm currently working with a health center in Oregon that was struggling with documentation for telehealth visits and was not getting a timely response from the EHR vendor. Um, so their CEO actually facilitated hiring an external consultant that was an expert in their EHR and they were able to um, install an, a program within their EHR that allowed them to provide telehealth visits 
via that EHR as well as link to their patient portal to have patients fill out screening tools and other relevant documentation prior. Um, so creating ways to facilitate the use of technology can make a big impact with provider satisfaction and thus retention. Establishing standing orders for nurses and medical assistants, um, this can really help alleviate some of the, the burden on providers um, and really enhance, again, that teamness. So I'll, I'll be providing in the next slide some resources, but the University of California, San Francisco's uh, Center of Excellence in Primary Care has some really good examples of uh, standing orders. Uh, using systematic workflow planning, including identification and elimination of waste through value stream mapping and standardization is another way to improve that practice environment. Um, and also looking at some of the pieces, like how do you create more teamness, how do you increase communication and trust, so doing things such as including non-clinical items in huddles or team meetings. Um, developing or attending mindfulness and resiliency training and other things um, like that could be really helpful. These are the resources that I just mentioned, um, a lot of information um, I pulled from here, and these are just resources that throughout the years I've accessed a lot when doing practice transformation um, support for health centers and other clinics across the country. Um, you'll get a copy of these slides, so you'll have access to these resources uh, post the, the meeting today. Moving on to succession planning. Um, here are a couple things to really keep in mind when doing succession planning. So integrate the succession planning into the organization's strategic plan and provide a proactive method for identifying and developing potential leaders. Um, one of the things to consider is making sure that the succession plan fits your organization. So there's not a cookie cutter succession plan that you could you could use. I mean, you could definitely get examples or other ideas, but you really want to make sure that it fits your organization. So a few questions to consider to see if it is a good fit is, um, do you want to complete? succession plan that includes every position and employee in your organization, or do you just want a succession plan that covers um, only upper management or other important leadership positions? Another question to consider is, will identifying and grooming successors be incorporated into performance review? And if so, what are the implications of that? Uh, do you have particular, particular vulnerabilities, really looking at do you have a large percentage of retiring employees in a particular uh, group or you know, looking at the age of your, of your staff and other pieces? And then really thinking of what's your ultimate goal? You know, what, what outcome are you hoping for for, for for doing this? So those are some questions to consider when developing a succession plan. Um, it is important to review and update your plan on a regular basis um, and, and make sure that it's up to date and it includes um, input from your providers and other team members. Okay, moving on to work-life balance, I'm actually going to have you participate a little bit here as well. Um, so I think we've talked about some examples of supporting work-life balance in some of the previous factors that I covered. Um, I'm list, I've listed here a few additional ones that you can look through, but I really would like to spend some time um, hearing from you. Um, what is your organization doing to improve work-life balance for your uh, providers and, and other staff as well? I'm going to monitor the chat. Um, feel free to, to send some ideas via chat. I'm not seeing any. Um, 
So as you're thinking about them and typing them in and sharing, um, I can go through some of the pieces here. Um, I think um, thinking of um, the hours of work and where those happen is important. For example, supporting remote charting and televisits um, is, is uh, can support that work-life balance, supporting working part-time, which we mentioned. Um, I, I know some practices that do provide uh, life coaches to providers, um, or at least some coaching sessions to help them find work-life balance. Um, so these are just some ideas. Um, Stacy, I see, encourage team members, coworkers to check with the, in with each other. Teleworking can be isolating. That's a that's a really good point. Um, it's nice to have sometimes uh, the ability to do um, televisits, but it can be very isolating. So making sure to create ways for the team to connect. And actually, there's some really great innovative um, ways now through all the changes with the COVID-19 pandemic that um, practices are holding team meetings and huddles uh, virtually with each other. So every morning they're getting together virtually and sharing um, kind of what are, they're planning for the day, what, what's been happening, and, and so forth. Um, also, I know that some of the televisits um, have been conducted um, in duos, so the MA is conducting it together with the provider um, and supporting with them, and so there's um, there's some back and forth there and some um, additional, um, you know, kind of camaraderie and teamness. Well, I don't see any others right now. Please feel free to continue sending if uh, some come along. So here are, um, we talked about last time, um, the seventh factor being fam family. Um, and I shared the components listed here that affect the decision-making of providers and their families to stay at an organization. So think creatively of how you can support providers with, um, with these uh, different components here, especially actually in the recruitment phase, uh, but checking in on an ongoing basis could really support retention. So some examples could be like helping um, providers find quality and affordable housing, uh, providing benefits that include emotional and social supports uh, for their family members, and even maybe providing support to their spouse uh, to find a job. Um, so really thinking out, outside the box on how you could support the whole family and not just um, the, the provider. If and you have any other thoughts around this, uh, please uh, chime in. And um, this is the, the last of my slides. And here's my contact information if you have any questions. And I will hand it back over to Suzanne. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Alexia. I know there are a lot of things that go into provider and also employee retention, and we really need to think about it from, from all different angles, and there are a lot of different solutions that work in varying different ways. And I know, especially when it comes to that work-life balance one, um, we'll get to that in a minute, but um, you know, there, it's definitely not a one size fits all approach. And Alexia gave you guys some great examples. And you know, if there's something that, um, you know, especially for that work-life balance, if you have it, um, I would love to hear it in chat because that one especially can be, um, can be different depending on where you live. And also um, who you are thinking about as far as you know what employers you're speaking to. So I'm gonna take that control of the slides real quick here. Okay. So when you get when you take the turnover calculator tool, um, you will get some recommendations. You will see all of the different information that comes in the you know, um, 
all of the different things that come out of that for your outputs, right? But then you're also going to see an action guide. And the action guide is a really a great place to dive into and take for your next steps. So what I'm going to do here is go through and sort of talk you through the action guide and then sort of see, you know, what's next. What, sorry, I'm forwarding my slides here um, a little too quickly. Um, you know, see what's next. What should you do after you have this turnover data, you see why people are leaving, and then what? So we're going to talk about that, and I really hope that once you have an opportunity to look at your turnover data, input it, and get those recommendations, um, we're going to chat about what maybe your next steps will be after that. Okay. So first of all, you're going to see, like I said, these two different, um, these two different screens. And they're, well, actually, it's going to be a document, excuse me. Um, but these are um, this is a screenshot of the screens here. So it's going to, um, your action guide is going to start here. And then you're going to come here. And it's going to sort of just lay it all out um, there for you. So now, when you're going through this, and when you're really working through all of the steps to really mitigate turnover, remember that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. But now that you have the data, you have the really the reasons why people are leaving your organizations, and you have what you can do to work on that, you have the data, you have the knowledge, you have the power to make a difference. So remember that when you're talking to your leaders about this, because it's important. And when you say, okay, here it is in black and white, here is, you know, what is, you know, here are the numbers, here are the reasons, let's do something about it. And that can really be powerful. So just remember that, you know, you're not, um, it might seem daunting, but at the same time, you have the knowledge and the data to back up what you're going um, to be doing and what you're going to be working on as far as turnover goes. Okay, so what now? What happens after you take the tool, after you have all this great data, after you have all these recommendations, what do you do now? It just seems kind of overwhelming. You've got the data, you can do this. Okay. So this is what we're going to talk about here in our remaining time together. So first of all, talk about your data. Um, talk, talk, talk. You know, communicate, communicate, communicate. It is just, when it comes to leadership and when it comes to all things, um, you know, change and all of those different types of things, communication is like location is to real estate, right? So you just want to make sure you're communicating about all of the different things that relate to turnover. You wanna think about, you wanna talk about what needs to be addressed. You wanna think about what your plans are and how you can work on it. Then, and, um, and a lot of those were um, some things that, that Alexia just talked about. All of those different things and more can be put into place to really mitigate the turnover. You then want to make sure you're doing a PDSA process in order to address those things and, uh, and really um, take a look at those different interventions um, to address the turnover. And PDSA stands for Plan, Do, Study, Act, and we'll talk about that in just a second. And then hopefully, yes, you will have less turnover due to the factors that you found out um, in your data because of the interventions that you put into place through those PDSA cycles. Okay, so first of all, Share, share, share. Yes, it's super important to emphasize it that much to put it in there three times. So you want to share and discuss your results that you got from your turnover tool with your leadership team. You want to see, is there anything that we didn't think that w w were we surprised about? Things that, okay, no, we knew that was going to be the case. So yeah, that's not shock shocking at all. Um, and just sort of really unpack it. It's sort of like peeling back the layers of an onion. Turnover is a multifaceted issue. And so we need, really need to really peel back all the layers of the onion to make sure that we're addressing all of those layers. Not only do you want to discuss the results with your leadership team, but we want to discuss the results with your managers. So this is something that's really important and you don't want to leave out. You don't want to just keep it high level. You want to make sure that your manager, especially your middle managing staff, is involved in these conversations. They are the ones that have some of the most 
impactful. They are, can be the most impactful to retention and they can be the most impactful to turnover. So you want to make sure that you're sharing all of that information with them so then they can be equipped to help you implement these, um, these solutions and these really these different items that you're going to try to mitigate turnover and reduce turnover to your organization. You also want to communicate your successes. So I can guarantee you that whatever your results are going to be, it's not all bad news, right? So you want to make sure that you are communicating what your team is doing well, where they're doing it well, and really highlight that because it is going to really sort of, it's going to be that positive cycle. We, a lot of times we think about the negative cycles and, you know, something negative becoming something negative and all that. You want to also emphasize those positive cycles, right? So if you're doing something well and your turnover is less than it was last year um, for a um, certain employee type, communicate that too. Say, you know, we thought that people were leaving because of X, but really it's not for that reason. It's because of Y and maybe something that you couldn't, you know, you couldn't control or, or, or things like that. Um, so make sure that you're sharing all of the things, positive and things, you know, where you have reasons for improvement. Um, so, you know, not only at the leadership level, managers, but also, um, you know, with, you know, as, as appropriate, right, um, with, um, with a larger part of your team. So make sure you're sharing all of that. And that's really the first place you want to start because without sharing that and making your, the rest of the team aware of what you're doing, you really, it's kind of hard to really get folks involved um, in the solutions there. So share what is going on. And then once, as you're starting to share, your those issues are really going to come to light, right? The, the onion is going to be peeled back and you're going to figure out what those issues are. And you're going to figure out what's going well. While you're doing that, you're going to figure being, figure, excuse me, you're going to start to figure out what are the root causes of the problems? You're going to look at all of those different types of data that you have. Obviously, you have turnover data, but you also have um, other HR data that you can pull in and really figure out, okay, what is going on here? You're talking to your managers. You're looking at data. You're putting all those things together, figuring out what the root causes are. And if you, you know, what additional data do you need? If you have all the data you need, that's great. But sometimes we need to pull in some other data. And so you can figure out what additional data you might need there. Figuring out the root causes of the problems and looking at those type of things, then you can go ahead and do that PDSA cycle and then figure out what you want to tackle next. So when we look at the PDSA cycle, we look at a couple things. We, well, excuse me, we start at, at, at the P for the plan. So plan, do, study, act. So plan. So when you're thinking about turnover, you want to figure out what changes you need to combat turnover issues. So it might be a turnover issue as it relates to your physician staff. It could be turnover issue as it relates to our medical assistants. Whatever the issue is, you want to make sure that you are really specific in what you are going to address in this PDA cycle. So what, I should have said, what change do you want to make to combat your turnover issues? So say if it is work-life balance, and I know that that's something that Alexia really talked about today. So you want to make a change to your work-life balance and figure out if you are seeing that people are voluntarily leaving the organization because of issues relating to that. They're not having enough time at home. They're having, you know, issues figuring out how to work childcare, any of those things that have that work-life balance issue, you know, figure out what you want to do to address it. So say in this case, you are addressing something having to do with work-life balance. So if you don't currently already, you might want to try and work on alternate work schedules as something to mitigate that um, that reason for turnover, right? Okay, so you don't have alternate work schedules and you're gonna put that into place to see if it helps that, com um, that separation issue um, as it relates to turnover. So you're gonna put the change into place. You're gonna allow your providers the ability to have alternate work schedules. So whether it is, you know, working, 
the, you know, the late shift every day. So they're going to come in at noon and leave at seven. If you have, you know, after hours, you know, or late hours at your, at your health center um, or three days a week or, you know, alternate working, you know, all of those type of alternate work schedules, put it, go ahead and put them into place. See what happens. And that's where the study comes in. So once you put, you, you figure out what you want to, you know, the changes you want to make, you put those changes into action. Then you take a look and you study what actually happened. What happened when we allowed our providers to work alternate, alternate schedules? Did it have a change in the turnover? So this is going to be something that you're really going to have to look at over a period of time. It's not like something that you're going to be like, okay, this is what we're going to do, and next month we're going to figure out if it works. Turnover is something that might take a while to look at. Now, you could implement something that might take a little bit less of time to look at and to study. But for this in particular instance and example, what I'm talking about is you're probably going to have to wait a little bit, but that's okay. Some changes might be, you know, might happen. It's going to be incremental change, right? And there, and you can't change everything at one time. So for this particular one, probably going to have to wait at least six months to a year to figure out if your changes worked. And at that length of time, no matter what it is, you're going to look and say, hey, did this make a difference in our turnover because of work-life balance, working alternate schedules? It might have, it might have not. And if it did, great. Keep that in. If, you know, especially, and you know, at this point too, not only you have the, um, the quantitative data, but you have the qualitative data too. What kind of feedback are you getting, right? So not only just the data and the numbers about people who are um, exiting your employment, at your health center, but also just the feedback from people. So is it working? Is it not working? If you have tried one type of alternate schedule and people are like, eh, you know, not really sure, you know, it might not be helping, but another type is, all of those types of things to say is that, you know, you just really want to study um, what happened and then act on it. So either keep the same intervention or change or, um, or, um, or you know, change it up and do something completely different. So the point is, you just want to think about something to change and figure out if that change is working um, through a PDSA cycle. And so as you're going along and looking at those specific interventions and doing your PDSA cycles and really looking at turnover and trying to combat it, you want to think, think about these key questions. So you want to figure out what are the specific and measurable issues to address. Obviously here it's turnover, um, but then also how are our strategies and how are our changes collectively leading to progress on that issue? It's really important to think about, um, and again, you wanna celebrate your successes, you're gonna fig figure out what interventions are working, what are you, um, you know, what are you trying to achieve and, and how are you doing it? And um, you, know, you really wanna celebrate that. Okay, so what else can you do to combat turnover and to really, um, figure out ways to move forward and to decrease turnover at your organization. So first of all, you can appoint a turnover champion. If you have a turnover champion at your health center, whoever it might be, put it in the chat. Tell me what their role is. Is it your CEO, COO? Um, is it your CMO? It is, is, it a, um, it just, is it your HR director? It could be your QI director, your project manager, or excuse me, a practice manager, any one of your chiefs, like I said, um, your C-suite, um, you want to think about appointing a turnover champion. And really that person is going to take the lead in figuring out the turnover issue. So they're going to be the one to really spearhead the project of looking at turnover at your organization. And again, it might be your HR person uh, or, you know, excuse me, your HR staff. It could be your, you know, somebody in your C-suite. So think about a appointing a turnover champion that really takes this on to help be the person to really um, be um, spearheading your efforts to peel back the onion and figure out how you can um, mitigate turnover at your organization. You could also possibly update your workforce plans. So figuring out what you need to do on both the recruitment side and the retention side to improve turnover um, is something that you can do. And it's very real, you know, um, your, your workforce plan, your R&R plan plays a big role in this. Um, you want to make sure that you're, you know, doing everything to hire the, the, um, the quote unquote right staff and also making sure that you're putting, um, you know, factors into place to really, um, to really help that plan there. 
Um, and then also too, as you're doing all this, you wanna make sure that you're keeping an eye on the financial impact of your workforce. So you wanna make sure that you're figuring out you know, how that plays a role in all of this. Because as I mentioned during the first webinar, turnover is huge and it really impacts your organization. And so if you're making these small incremental steps, you wanna make sure that you're also keeping an eye on that bottom line and how, um, and hopefully that's going up and how your turnover to organization is not, um, is going down and therefore the financial impact is going down as well. Um, and then you can also take a look at, as you know, as you're looking at data, um, I mentioned a couple slides ago, you know, there are a lot of different data metrics that you can explore as part of this. Um, you know, along with turnover, um, a lot you have, you know, HR data, other organizational data that you might have, really bring that into, um, into play with this. And it can really be helpful as you are looking to combat turnover at your organization. As we wrap up today, I just wanted to mention some other Star Center tools that we have that complement our new turnover tool and also the financial impact tool that we showcased during the first webinar. So we talked a lot about burn burnout, and Alexia touched a lot on that um, during her, you know, the reasons people leave, and also, you know, how you can uh, mitigate that. And then um, Dr. Mack also addressed it um, in our um, in our prior webinar. And really, it's important. We need to think about it, and we need to make sure that we're not leaving it out of the turnover conversation. So we have a burnout self-assessment tool, and this burnout tool really takes the approach of assessing burnout from an organizational standpoint. There are a lot of turnover tools out there that take a look at it from a personal perspective. So say if I'm an employee and I'm looking at what I can do to help turnover or excuse me, burnout within you know myself and prevent and mitigate burnout within myself, this is from an organizational standpoint. Because if your organization is really addressing it at the organizational level, it really helps the um, you know the entire team, not just the physician, not just you know support staff. It really um, takes a look at it from um, from the entire organization standpoint. It's a really quick burnout assessment, and um, you know it should only take about ten minutes to complete. And you will be left with some some strategies to help both improve um, excuse me to improve provider retention and also re reduce burnout. So um, we hope you will, in conjunction with uh, the turnover tool, you'll have a chance to um, take this burnout self-assessment um, self tool to get some re recommendations based on your input and sort of some further reading that you can work towards uh, mitigating burnout at your organization. I also mentioned updating your workforce plan as a part of all of the work around turnover at your organization. So we here at the Star Center have a provider recruitment and retention plan and a whole host of tools that go along with it. You can find it on our website and Mariah is going to put that one also in chat if she has a minute there to do that. And we have, when I say a whole host of resources around this, we really do. We have webinars, we have um, instructions, sort of booklet, if you will, that takes the template and then puts instructions with it, which is wonderful because it gives you an opportunity to take a look at the why we put some things in our r, &R template. And um, it's really great because you can say, oh, okay, I didn't really know what they meant by this, but when I look at the instructions, I can see exactly what they meant and um, give some examples about you know, tables that, we're, that, um, that, we, that we have in there and how you fill them out, um, as well as an action plan. So um, that's another great tool that we have. And again, tons of resources surrounding that. So we have given you a whole, lot of things to think about during the series and a whole lot of tools that you can, you know, you start with a turnover tool, you think about all the different things that we have here at the Star Center. And we, so we would really encourage you to engage with all of the other tools that we have at the Star Center and figure out what we can do to help you at your organization as you go along with the, um, with improving turnover to organization. So with that, I know we gave you a lot of information today, but we just wanna give you guys a chance to really digest it a little bit and ask some questions. And um, certainly you can put them in the chat. 
that will be probably the best place to put them. And as always, if you have any questions after this, we are available to help. And as you're going along and taking that, um, uh, taking, uh, entering that information into your tool, if you have any questions about the output, certainly let us know. We are here for you um, today and also moving forward. So I don't see any questions that have come up yet. But Mariah, if you want to go ahead and launch in a second that session evaluation, that would be great. You can do that while we're still here. Alexi and I are still here to answer any questions you might have, but we would really appreciate if you would answer the evaluation before you hopped off. That would be wonderful. And a big shout out to Alexia for joining us for this three-part series. Um, appreciate her uh, valuable insight and expertise um, as it relates to all things health centers and especially turnover for this series. So, um, Thank you so much, Suzanne. Really a pleasure to be here with all of you through this series. Uh, you know, one note I wanted to make uh, briefly on the PDSA cycle and the Plan Do Study Act is when you're testing changes, think of testing small changes first and then making them larger. So really start with one provider, see what happens, how it goes, get provider satisfaction data back, so survey, ask how that went, and, and then start spreading it to a larger cohort. It makes it yeah. a lot easier to tackle that way. Yeah, that's a great that's a great point, and thank you for bringing that up and adding that to it. It's yeah, it's easy to make incremental change and big changes at once. So thank you for that. Well, don't see any questions, um, but again, thank you everybody for joining us. Thank you to Alexia and the rest of the Star Center team, and um, we will talk to you guys soon. Don't, don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.